Okay, everybody, so thank you for coming. My name is Evan Weinberg. I am a math teacher at Saigon South International School down at Ho Chi, in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, this is my second year in Vietnam. I taught in China for six years um, at Hangzhou International School, and before that I taught in uh, New York City. You are all here, hear a little bit about computational thinking. Uh, how many of you already consider yourselves doing computational thinking within your classrooms already? A show of hands. Not so much. I need to know what, more about what it is. Okay, so right. we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Uh, any coders in the room? Cool. Excellent. Math, math and science teachers, I think we have a couple. Great. Uh, humanities teachers? Tech coaches? Awesome. And other? Music. <laughs> Music. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so my hope um, is to get an idea of, or my hope is to develop your skills a little bit today in understanding kind of um, what computational thinking is. Um, we're going to start doing that by kind of getting your feet wet. You're going to do some activities. Some of them, I'll just give you some time to play around with them. Some of them we're going to do together. But my hope is that you get from these activities sort of a sense of uh, the types of things I am talking about. I also want to uh, tell you a little more about computational thinking. Why is it a good idea? What does it do? I'm going to get on my soapbox just for a little bit. And then close to the end, I'm, we're going to start talking about some ways to make it yours. How do you actually make computational thinking happen in your classroom? Uh, I believe, because we have such a, a broad diversity of, of roles here, I believe that keeping everybody on the hook is kind of my job. So I don't want anyone thinking, well, I'm not a math and science teacher like you, Evan, so I, I'm not going to be able to do this. Uh, I want you to be able to believe, I want you to believe, and I also want you to see that you can do some of these things that I'm talking about. Uh, second thing, I don't want you to think, well, Evan, I don't code, so because I don't code, these things that you built and are maybe proud of, I'm not going to be able to do in my context. And I want to make sure you understand that I believe you can, even if you don't uh, code in any particular language. Um, and the last thing, and I don't, I don't think anyone in, this category, anyone in this room at this conference fits in the category of not being good at technology, but I've had people... Uh, teachers before tell me, well, I'm not good at technology, so it's great, Evan, everything you're, you're selling looks cool, but I, I'm not good with technology, so this is very nice, I'm going to go and, and do what I do. Um, I want all of you to believe that you can do some of these things. So I'm going to send you really quickly to our companion page. Uh, it's titled The Computational Thinking Classroom, there's a QR code, there's a a shortened URL as well. Uh, go there. We're going to start and spend about five minutes um, doing a quick little activity. There's a link up at the top of the web page. It says activity one, fill in the blank. Um, all I want you to do is play around with this, see what you can come up with in a short amount of time. We may not even need the full five minutes to get to it. So it's going to look a little bit like this when you see that. You see there's a bunch of, uh, there's a text box at the top, there are a bunch of sentences there. Your task is very simple, find a word that works. Uh, what were some words that you tried filling in there? Sour. Sour. Cool? So the milk is soured, I love how the magician can sour water into wine. Perfect. Okay, so some of those, looks like it might work, some not so much. Um, I tried change. Change. Interesting. The milk has changed. The magician can change water into wine. Come on, it isn't your change. Especially if you change it. So some of these definitely work. Turn. Um, one more? Change on the Turn. TV, though. Doesn't work, though. The what? Change on the TV. Oh, change on the TV. Definitely. So turn. Turn water into wine. Isn't your turn? Awesome. Flip. Try that. Flick. Oh, flick. Okay. Milk has flicked, <laughs> flick water into wine. Um, I, I shared this with, um, with some friends. Um, they instantly put in poop. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's pretty entertaining. Um, I hope you understand here that, that this is something you could do with pencil and paper. 
This could be a worksheet. This could be something that you give your students as kind of an inquiry activity, say which word fits. But I want you to think about how in this activity, the computer is doing some things for us to make it so that your, your focus was not on, I have to write this five, six, seven times to see if it works. The computer took care of that for us. So the computer's strength of being able to take one idea and replace it in a bunch of different locations, that's something that the computer does well. This also suggests the concept of, of a variable, the abstraction that we have a place, a placeholder for an idea in several locations in all of these sentences. And by typing something in there, we are filling in all of those placeholders with something that we create. And that's significant. Uh, that right there is a pretty important computational thinking exercise. Um, so I want to take a look at the next activity. So this is uh, a little bit more involved. This is a Google Doc. Um, it's actually a link to a spreadsheet. You'll see some sample commands in there. This is something that I call the Citizen Database. And it is a collection of way too many simulated ficti fictitious uh, people and some characteristics about them. And so if you click on the link and open that up, you'll need to make a copy of it. But once you make your copy, you can put in some of these commands that I've made suggestions of here and start answering some of the questions that are there on the data queries sheet. So let's take maybe about five minutes playing around with that. Uh, and then again, we'll um, connect back up after we've had some time to interact with this. So I'll just bring your attention back for, for a minute here. I want to talk about some of the elements of this. So uh, how many of you were successful in writing some queries, some questions uh, about this, this city, this collection of people? Yeah, OK. I'm, I'm hurrying you along a lot more than I would students, certainly. Uh, we would, I would be a bit more hands-on in terms of making sure that, that everyone uh, got on and I would share this in advance so that students would check with me to know if they had access. Um, what sorts of questions came to mind as you started looking at this and as you started exploring the data itself? Or some of the things you started to think about? And one question I heard was, what is, what is the definition of a minor, which is important for the purposes of answering one of those questions? How many minors uh, are there? What kind of a society is this? Wealthy if so many people have helicopters. Sure, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yep, people with mansions. There are people driving scooters, of course. I actually had a question that came up while I was doing it. I, yep. I just had to think for a second. Sure. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any additional information that we could have gathered about these people to better understand them. I think that leads into your next question. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, the, the thing that I am getting at, actually, maybe I should get to some of the background of why I did this. Uh, with my pre-calculus class, um, I had created this database a while ago. Uh, but with my pre-calculus class, I was putting together a lesson on probability, and we were going to do some of the standard... Uh, questions where you take a marble out of a jar and the jar has 20 blue and 50 green and, and that sort of thing. And I just kind of got bored uh, thinking about that. And so what I decided was let's, let's give students an actually interesting data set that they could really get into and teach some ways to analyze that data such that they can't just add things together in their head and get an answer. Uh, so I said, let's, let's piece together some sources of data, or let's create something where they might be able to ask questions. And it's not something that they could just manually find the answer to. We have to have the computer to help us with this. There are over 18,000 entries in that, in that spreadsheet. Can I ask how you yep. made it? I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So um, this is one of those situations where uh, my students sort of roll their eyes and just sort of say, yes, Mr. Weinberg, we get it. You're again forcing us to use the computer to do something that given any other way we would do by hand, yeah, 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 they get this, which means they've been properly indoctrinated. Um, but the computer in this case took care of all the counting, the sorting, the identifying, um, and we were able to answer some of the questions. We were able to uh, come up with, from the computer's commands, 
answers to questions like, how many minors are there? Some of the questions that I asked my, my pre-college students, you'll notice that it has a, a voting preference there. And so I asked them, uh, who's gonna win the election this year? If we run this election in a year, when suddenly we have more people who are of voting age, how might the results change? And so we had students asking these, these questions about this data in a way that they wouldn't if all of their energy was focused on the manual counting and figuring out uh, things by hand. Um, now, as Alex asked, like, how did I generate this? I wrote, uh, I wrote a JavaScript program to come up with this. Kind of something that tends to happen when I go to conferences like that is I share something that, that I wrote myself and someone shares a online resource that does the exact same thing but better and anyone can access it. So I, I actually found this place, this site called generatedata.com, which makes it so that you can create data that has uh, names, it has income, it has all sorts of different things uh, associated with it. Uh, you, can, you can do all sorts of things with this. The other thing that might be on your mind with respect to this is did you have to make up this data? Is there any data out there that wouldn't need to be made up? Can we actually solve some real world problems? And the answer of course is yes. There's tons of data out there. I've included on that companion site some links to uh, places where you can find some of this data. Um, if you, and, and the only way I found it is I went to Google and I typed in free data sources and there were tons. I also am sure that you within your schools have spreadsheets of data that you already use for some purpose. Maybe it has student sensitive information so you don't want to throw that out there but there are surveys, there are election results. I'm sure there's tons of information within your school that could be gathered and collected that students could then analyze in a way that isn't just by hand counting things up. Um, you may have seen this TED talk a while ago. This was from 2006. Um, it's Hans Gosling, um, or Rosling. Uh, and he does this great visualization of world data, economic data, poverty, um, uh, life expectancy, all of this. And so in this particular case, the computer is not only organizing that information, but displaying it, displaying it in a way that's really uh, useful and that leads to more questions. Um, so he did this TED Talk and there were a couple subsequent uh, TV programs that kind of enhanced this. You can now go to uh, a website called gapminder.org and you have access to the same visualization tools that he uses in his talk. Again, this is the computer doing what it does really well, and that is organizing the information, displaying the information, collecting it, and you also get really slick animation of what this data looks like with respect to time. This leads to students asking all sorts of questions, uh, and I encourage you to explore this as a, a, a way to get your students talking. Um, so this is really, really pretty slick and kind of neat, getting students asking questions. Uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to turn to the, the third activity. If you go to uh, the website, uh, yeah, move the points. So take a look at activity three. Okay. So here you can see that we have everyone's, uh, everyone's work separately. The other thing the computer can do for us, um, and this is probably the most powerful thing, is allow us to look at everybody's answers together. And that's the most powerful thing, I think, about this particular activity because you all moved five points. You used the computer. The computer was constantly calculating to give you information about where those points uh, were with respect to the black point. What I can now do is take all of your answers and put them together into one. And you start to see now the shape of what seems to be the result of our collaborative work, right? Is it a circle? Does it make sense that it's a circle? We start asking these questions. Not a single person here has had to calculate using the distance formula where one point is with respect to another. We have students who are getting intuition about the ideas that we're exploring here about distances of points with respect to one another. Uh, we'll look at some of the other ones. So it's not quite as uh, uh, definitive on this one. I'll show you this one. I don't think we have, uh, we have some amount of some amount of pattern perhaps developing. 
uh, on this one as well. Uh, I'll just share very quickly. Um, when I did this with my pre-cal class, there were some very clear patterns. Uh, they came out of this and that was this. So that first example that you did was a circle. With my pre-calc students, the second idea that I had you do, you get that curve all the way to the left. That's in math what we call the parabola. And it is defined geometrically by the set of points that are the same distance away from a point and a, a fixed line. And so we can see that coming out of our collective data. The computer made it possible for us to see this just from each of us doing something simple. The difference uh, question, which is the last one I asked you, uh, results in a hyperbola. So you can kind of get a sense of how this started as kind of a light, intuitive math-ish activity, but it now leads to other questions. And at no point did you have to pull out a pencil and paper and start doing calculations. This was you exploring uh, on your own. So the computer in all of these examples that I just showed you, in all three activities, it was in charge of uh, calculating, displaying results, organizing, uh, counting, asking questions, so, uh, and also trying to display information in a way that we designed a certain way. It collected answers from each other. It let us look at everybody's work at the same time. Um, it would be really hard to argue in those three, three tasks that we did today that the computers did all the work. You did some thinking. You came up with some questions through these examples, through these tasks. Um, the computers did work that they were designed to do the work that they were good at. We spent our time asking and answering questions. And the computer took on the task that it did best, and that is computing, iterating, displaying, organizing information, which gets us to the heart of computational thinking. And that is this, this idea that some tasks are much better left to a computer. Okay, so I have some, some examples of things here. It isn't that we aren't capable of doing some of these tasks ourselves, it's that the computer is designed and is particularly skilled at these tasks. Um, we can program them to do these tasks so much more efficiently than we can. And figuring out how to translate questions and things that we wanna know into computer instructions, uh, first off, that's the process we call often programming, but more generally, that's computational thinking. The idea of taking a series, a, a real world problem and breaking it into a, a series of, of instructions and algorithms to find an answer that we're looking for. So if we let computers do what they do best, that means that we as humans can focus on what we do best, right? We know or we can figure out what questions are actually the important ones to ask. We can take big problems and we can divide them into smaller ones. Uh, we saw a lot out of uh, Dr. Shufra's talk today about there are many things that can be automated and that perhaps should be automated, but there are a lot of things that we can be better, uh, that if we can automate those processes, it makes us available to do the tasks that right now computers aren't so great at. Um, we can make simplifying assumptions, right? Sometimes making an assumption that is reasonable makes it so that we can solve a problem, otherwise it's intractable. Um, there are things that sometimes we need to be able to do qualitative comparisons. There's a reason why websites ask us to find the dog here. And even this task, uh, which is uh, from a website from a few years ago, this is outdated now. Now, uh, you're often asked to do more subtle things. Like out of all these pictures, Google now asks you to click the ones that have boats in them. And that's how it figures out if you're a human or not. Um, Robots right now don't answer those questions really easily, but humans can and kids can too. So making good choices about what we as humans can do and what computers should do is the essence of computational thinking and it's something that we often in our classrooms don't get our students uh, to do enough. Um, so just a quick, quick alert, I'm gonna go through some things that, that are just me on my soapbox about computational thinking and why I think it matters. 
I'm gonna rush through these because I do wanna to get to the part where we talk about how you might go about uh, thinking about this in your classroom. So um, we live in a world that's visual. We see the world, we interact with it visually. Uh, when we're very young, from a very young age, we experiment with this visual world and try to figure out uh, using not just our visual sense, but all of our senses to figure out how we fit into the, into the universe. We learn language by observing how others communicate. Um, we learn by trial and error, that's how we do it. Uh, this is my daughter, Nora. Uh, she is a little, little over two years old. Um, and this is us during our uh, Tet break um, a couple weeks ago in a, in a park in New Zealand. This was the first time that she, all on her own, um, climbed up this structure, climbed the ladder, and went down a slide that big. She'd never done that before. We had, sure, we picked her up and we put, it on, put her up on, on shorter slides, but she made the decision to try to climb up, to go to the top, and to push herself down. Um, she didn't need a series of steps that she then needed to copy down in her notebook. I didn't uh, make sure that she had mastered climbing and that she had passed my climbing test before she was allowed to get up onto that platform and move herself down the slide. I hope I'm not veiling my point too much here. Um, when she was younger, I may not have let her go on the, on the highest slide. That would have been pretty unsafe, but I put her on smaller ones. I gave her this opportunity to have the experience of the slide, even though she may not have been able to do everything by herself. Um, we also see a lot of these in Vietnam, stacks of bricks that are about to be used for something. Um, the way we often teach is thinking about knowledge and skills that we want our students to have as the stack. Before we can get to the highest level stuff, we need to be able to do the basics. And so we think about how we get our students thinking about the basics and the basics alone. And the reality is that some, some students just have trouble with the basics. And it's often some of those same students who struggle with the basics that ask that question, when are we gonna use this? Why do we need to be learning this? Um, these students might get stuck on the basic bricks on the ones at the bottom, and they may never get up to the top ones because they're stuck on, uh, on these basic skills. It's a pretty cruddy deal because they never get to go down the slide. Right? They never get to attack these bigger picture questions, these bigger problems. Um, I wanna make sure that it's clear I am not advocating things like this. I'm not saying we need to give an equation and then instantly give them a computer tool that finds a solution. Uh, if that is the sort of question that we kind of end with, that is not using computational thinking effectively. That is using a computer as an answer finder. And that's, to be honest, not very interesting. Um, questions that, that can be answered like this are not the complex ones that we really want our students to be able to uh, answer. Um, these things often are the bottom bricks in our stack. Um, I teach physics, and one of the things that I used to do uh, in the physics class is projectile motion, and I would start what I thought were the basics. We'd do some very algebraic, an algebraic treatment of what it means to have something that shoots as a projectile. What is happening in the x direction? What's happening in the vertical direction? And uh, there were some students who never got over those abstractions, those abstract ideas. Um, so th there were top students who had no problem with it, and sometimes those are the ones that we gauge how our lesson is going. It's like we look, and, and the same students are nodding along, and we think, yeah, super teacher, right, I get this. But it's the students that get lost in the abstraction, the students that ask those questions about why we're doing this, they are also sometimes the ones that, that uh, get left behind, and we sort of say, you know, we've been doing these activities for a while, you need to memorize it. And it's a tragedy sometimes when we have to go that route. Um, these students often find that they want just the steps. Tell me the steps that I need to follow in order to get to an answer. And so I changed my approach. And my approach is that I gave them a projectile motion simulator. This is actually linked as activity four. I figured we weren't gonna have time with it and I was right, time to do this and I was right. 
But activity four is all about, um, I give you those questions and I say, here's a projectile motion simulator. Um, go through this simulator and actually, uh, actually play with it. So uh, the idea is you slide that slider around. There are some controls on the left-hand side about the initial conditions for the projectile. And I actually have students answer a whole series of questions that I give them using just this. And if nothing else, the main benefit that came out of that is I had every single student reading the question, figuring out what the answer was supposed to look like in the end, and figuring out what information that was given in the problem is actually relevant. Those are things that in the algebraic task, I almost never was able to consistently get every student to do. But when you start with this, when you start in a way that lets the computer do the calculations, the creation of the, mo the uh, uh, calculation involved in the model, the displaying of the model, the students can focus on what it means. You also get students who will look at this and say, you know, this is really tedious that I have to open up this tool every single time to answer a projectile motion question. And so they, they ask, is there a better way? And that's when I get to swoop in with my uh, teaching skills and get to say, yeah, here. Here are some tools that I would like you to be able to use that are perhaps a little easier. Um, they, they are algebra, they are graphs, there are other techniques. This is the content that I now want my students to learn. And they're a little, they're hooked because now they know that they can get the answer if they want. It might be a little annoying getting that answer though. We also have some really good conversations about simplifying assumptions. Uh, I, I use this word model a lot with my students. The idea is that a model is a way that a computer or, or we can approximate the real world in a way that is simpler than the actual real world. Um, simplifying assumptions make it so that we can actually solve certain problems. The reason, so uh, the dots of data that you see there, that's, that's experimental data. We can see that the model on the left is the right model because the shape is roughly correct, right? So we're using the right model here. So we need to change some of the characteristics of our model in order to make it so that it fits the description uh, in the data. On the right-hand side, we run into the fact that our data from the real world might not fit our model. And that doesn't mean that our data is wrong. The data might be real. We live in the real world. The real world has air. <laughs> if everything we do is using a model that ignores air, that makes it perhaps a little bit impractical to always uh, just stick to this model. And then when it's inconvenient, say, well, projectile motion equations, they just don't apply in this situation and you'll have to wait several years into university before you can attack this. Students clearly see that the model is not appropriate. And the computer's ability to display information, to change that model, lets them see that. There's no way that you can change the parameters of that parabola to make it fit the data. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is that we as professionals solve problems this way. We don't necessarily go all the way back to the basics unless that allows us to solve problems. What we do is we uh, play with the problem, we figure out what it means, we think about breaking it down. We start with a tool that gets us to the answer most quickly. Um, and so the computer is a tool that allows us to manage the more abstract concept. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to um, a couple things. So this is uh, a way I did formulas in science, and again in a physics class, but this applies in a lot of different situations. I used to teach this way, and I would say to my students, play with this equation, pencil and paper see how it works, use it to solve some problems. And they didn't really get into it. Um, what I switched to is the idea of using a spreadsheet as a way that I could give this model to students and have them investigate what it is, have them figure out what's going on there. Um, it's intuitive. Like I could ask them, what are the effects of the different variables? What do they do? Um, this gets the students in the room, everybody, uh, in the game. They can change the numbers, they can make it fit for a given problem, a given question that I, that I give them. Um, the instruction that I gave them was uh, generally don't touch the red 
boxes. Those are where I automatically calculate something. The black boxes, change those numbers, see what happens. Some of them, just by virtue of by saying don't click on the red boxes, would click on the red box, of course, right? Because they're, they're uh, in many cases, teenagers. Um, opposition is in their, is, is their definition, right? But when they do that, oh no, now they see a formula they can use. Mm -hmm. Now they have the ability to sort of see what is going on mathematically with this, and, and this is a very powerful tool. Um, and I've used this in a bunch of different situations. Um, and I'll just, so factoring trinomials, anyone remember this? So like x squared minus 5x plus 6, make it a product of two binomials looking like that. Okay, um, I'm not going to force all of you to relive that, but I'll tell you that it's an algorithm. It's a procedure that you can go through. And uh, I, I would tell students, again, just uh, go through this procedure, and then you can check this procedure by just doing some algebra. And so for my students, this was particularly when I was teaching in New York, for my students who were not good at arithmetic in the first place, I was basically telling them, look, you can check if your arithmetic is right by doing more arithmetic. And they said, no, thank you. This is not worth my time. So what I started doing was showing them how they could build a little tool in a spreadsheet to check this. And uh, essentially what this did was they would come up with the first number, come up with the second number, calculate what the sum is, and they would say, is the sum equal to what is supposed to equal? And if it's not, um, don't look at it. You drag this down, only one of those is gonna end up being true. There's your answer. And then we talk about how do we get, if we know number one, how do we get number two? And they're very eager to talk about the arithmetic. Oh, well, you, you can divide this, it's not a problem. If you throw X's and Y's in there, they, they freak out, they don't want any part of it. But when you talk about the concrete idea of arithmetic, let the calculator handle that arithmetic part. You have conversations around what this means, what these calculations mean. And so you get students now who are okay putting together something like this, and it takes some time for them to come comfortable with it. But you can get them into something like this, and they see this as a part of their, their tool set. Um, and I'll just show you one, one last thing. So uh, I had trouble giving students, again, going back to physics, um, a, uh, an understanding of what it meant for something to go in orbit. We can't exactly tell a student, um, just go and put something into orbit and see how it works. So we can give them a computer model that is ready built for them to experiment with. Um, and so the idea here is to actually simulate something that Newton proposed uh, way back in the 17th century as how orbits could work. And so he theorized that if you fired a cannon, uh, a cannonball at fast enough velocity that it could potentially go all the way around the Earth. I couldn't picture this um, when I took physics, <coughs> but my students saw this and they're like, oh yeah, of course, no big deal. I was like, do you understand all the stuff that went into this? But they just accepted it because they could see it. We don't have to talk about this as a theoretical exercise because the students can see it, they can trust it, they know this is uh, their, the physics and the math that I have to teach them is embedded in this. Some of them will ask the questions, how does it work, how can I use this? Others will sort of say, yeah, I get this. I think um, I can understand more of this. And so the last thing I'll say is, um, very often we have, and, and I keep hearing this, that apparently math teachers are some of the hardest to move on this. Um, I work with some, some great colleagues. We talk all the time about this, but I understand it. You have to be able to do it by pencil and paper in the end. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, because I teach in high school, I think about College Board for AP exams, I think about uh, IBO for the IB exams. Right now, they only assess on paper. So they do need to be able to do these things on paper. But that isn't a reason to always do things by paper, by, by hand. There are ways that we can program the computer, create using the computer to do some really sophisticated things. Um, and letting computation be in the way of those higher order thinking skills is uh, it, it doesn't do students um, a service and it takes away opportunities from them. Um, so 
Uh, all this stuff that I'm talking about, it's in the Common Core Standards of Mathematical Practice. It's in the Next Generation Science Standards. So this stuff is relevant, it's important. It's also in the ISTE standards for teachers and things that you could be doing for, uh, for your students in creating <coughs> these learning activities. But uh, what I wanna end with is just some, some things that you should think about as you move forward. You might have a worksheet that you're planning on using on Monday or Tuesday when you go back to school. Is there a way that you can turn that worksheet into something that allows for some play? Can you let the computer through a spreadsheet, through a searching activity, through uh, find and replace on Google Docs or uh, Pages or Microsoft Word. Is there some way that you can use the computer to take care of the repetitive work, the iterative work, the organization work, so that your students can spend more time thinking and asking the big questions? Is there some way, instead of and handing students a formula and just having them deal with it, can you get them to program that formula into some uh, uh, platform that they use? So I had some students who were amazed that after I taught them to calculate the, the discriminant for quadratic equations, that I was okay if they put a little program into their calculator to calculate it every time. As long as they did it and they understood how it worked, I was okay with that. Some students wanted to do it in a spreadsheet and I said fine. I may not let you use that during, during a test, but uh, this, if this helps you understand what's going on, that's great. <laughs> so I had the weaker students who liked knowing that they had this support in the classroom. I had some stronger students who took this and said, I like this, I want more of this, and they went on to then program addition, additional functionality into it. Can we make this tell me that there are two solutions in this equation as opposed to one? And I pointed them to resources to be able to do that. Can you get students to collect data and look at data in a new way? Can you get them to use a spreadsheet uh, to analyze data that might be interesting to them or is m important to your community? Um, can you make predictions about a set of data before you dig into it? And at the same time, are you creating tasks because uh, the reality is that we all have content that we need to teach. Are you creating tasks that both allow students to play and figure things out, but at the same time motivate them to see the benefit of the content that you're trying to teach them? So this was a task that I designed for students uh, involving navigating around this island. And my goal was to get them to see that instead of kind of doing this by trial and error, they could make some calculations using trigonometry to figure out where each of those points needed to be to make it around the island in the minimum amount of time. And so I had some students doing this by guessing and checking. And then I had one student ask me if she was allowed to calculate the angles using a triangle. And I hadn't, I, I hadn't uh, prompted them with this. I just said, here's this task, go at it. I want you to be good at it. And I had a student asking me if they were allowed to use what I had just taught them in class a couple days ago. That's awesome. It feels great as a teacher when that happens. Um, so computers are tools. Calculators are tools. The pencil is a tool. These are all tools available to us. Um, and they all have a place in our classroom, perhaps. And I'm not saying dispense with all the tools that are non-technology. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just encouraging you to make wise choices with respect to the tools that you use in your classroom, that you use and also your students use. Um, and I encourage you to give students the freedom to choose a tool that works best in a given situation, because that's another element that's really important to computational thinking. All right, well thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate your time. Um, my, uh, this is my contact info. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I also, I, I have a blog, Twitter is an easy way to get a, get a hold of me, school email, but it's just uh, eweinberg at ssis.edu, no, I don't have that on there either, okay, poor planning Weinberg, all right, um, but I will share some of these resources uh, through Twitter, you have this site, um, I'll make sure my contact info is there too, um, in case you have any questions moving forward, okay, thanks everybody for coming, Thank you. appreciate it. Thank you.